So, uh, PJ, thank you very much for, for doing this. Uh, you know, we've kind of tangled on Twitter a few times before now. Uh, no, it's a good thing to tangle, though. Indeed, indeed. We, it's one of the ways of, uh, of figuring out where differences are and then hopefully trying to resolve those differences. Correct. So uh, what we're talking about here is obviously the uh, the events around November the 14th, 2004, which is the, uh, the, the Nimitz encounters. And your initial involvement in, in this, the Nimitz encounters, which is, you know, the famous encounter with Commander David Fravor seeing a tic-tac-shaped UFO, uh, all these different radar contacts. Kevin Days famously saw these, these radar contacts and Chad Underwood producing the famous video, which was later released. Uh, so everyone kind of knows about those things, and, and your your initial involvement in the in the events was, uh, I, I believe, like mostly limited to this strange encounter where you had to hand over these these data bricks. Correct. At the, at the time, yeah. But since then, you've kind of become a lot more involved in the discussion around the whole uh, event, uh, partly because of your position as an eyewitness, but also you're. A, Kind of like a, a technical expert on, on the, the Navy matters and the, the events of of those days, uh, and you've also more recently become involved with the UAP Expeditions, which is this uh, this, this company that I believe Kevin Day uh, and Gary Voorhis are the co-founders, and uh, you and a bunch of other people uh, related uh, to the event have been involved in in this as well. So we can talk about that as well. So sure, I just wanted to. Just wanted to set the scene. Um, so, going back to two thousand and four, could you just say when you personally were first aware that something unusual was going on? I mean, for, for the most generic purposes, where we were training off of, of the coast of Mexico, Southern California, is a routine training area for us. We've been there okay. a lot. The type of training we did, the type of flight schedules we ran. It's all relatively normal. You know, the only thing that differed very day to day was, you know, what time our plane launched or what time our plane came. You know, it was all standard training. We had done previous deployments. Um, so we kind of knew what was going on. We're on deck when we need to launch our airplane. We um, There's a lot of systems on the Hawka that take time to turn on and warm up. So we're up there several hours before. You know, we can listen to radio traffic. That plane's got a lot of radios. Sometimes we take a nap. It's kind of hard to say what we do <laughs> once that plane's up and running when we wait for the air crew. And, you know, the plane eventually leaves with the air crew. It comes back. We get back on that airplane. We make sure they didn't break anything. We have a bunch of classified hard drives on that airplane that we have to take off when we're not in the airplane. Um, and that's obviously how I got involved in this whole thing. Um, the Hawkeye that was airborne during... Uh, Commander Fravor's intercept, the one that Kevin Day actually took control of Fravor from. Okay. Uh, we were running, and I have to be very vague about this part because part of it is mm -hmm. something classified. We were running some system tests for something that was on the airplane that is separate from anything that had to do with the ticket. It okay. was not involved. It was not used for it. All we were doing was recording everything they saw. So basically, a complete screen capture of everything they did, what, uh, everything from you know their mouse clicks to what menus they open, to what they saw, to a bunch of background information. All of that was being recorded on these bricks, and I know for a fact it was being recorded because I'm the one who hit the record button. Okay. Um, and so when it came oh, sorry, back, go ahead. those specific bricks, you know, we obviously had to take them out of the airplane anyways, but they were eventually going to be when we return to San Diego uh, a week or so later, we're going to be turned over to some civilians to basically analyze the data. So they okay. already had a purpose, but what inadvertently happened because, you know, obviously somebody knew we were recording that stuff. Somebody wanted all that data because of all the other stuff they could have seen. You know, it had radar information on it. It had ESM information on it. There was a lot of information that those um, those bricks had. So after you know, I got those bricks out of the airplane, take them down, put them in our safe. You know, 10, 15 minutes later, who knows the exact timeline of 
minutes after this many years, but it was within 15, 20 minutes of me putting those bricks back in the safe. Um, my commanding officer and two guys in Air Force flight shoots show up at our door on the, on the ship. And where my work center was on the ship, if you ever look at the, the flight deck of an aircraft carrier from the top, on the left-hand side, mm-hmm. you see the, the landing lenses, the Fresnel lenses that they use to, to judge landing. Right. My shop yeah. is almost right underneath that. Okay. We're far away from where the ready room is and far away from where my skipper is. And they don't come to our shop. We go to them. Hmm. So for my skipper to come all the way over to my shop was abnormal enough already for him to show up with two guys in Air Force flight suits who stick out like Thor's uh, sore thumbs because they're not on the ship. Um, you know, all that starts adding up to things that are weird. And he simply says, I need the bricks off that last flight. No no paperwork, no other discussion, no nothing. He just wanted them. We got them out of the safe, put them in the bags. He took them. They left. And honestly, that was the last I had thought about it for, for quite a while. And then right. Roger, who is a friend of mine, uh, another enlisted avionics tech, uh, was flying on that flight. He went through debrief and a bunch of other stuff, some of which he was able to share. Um, he shared with both myself and with Dave Beatty. Um, when he came back, he kind of started to tell us what happened. Mm. Um, and then somebody walked in and he was shut down real quick. So that was basically the end of it for ages, and it became a drinking story until I saw Dave Beatty's documentary and obviously started diving back into everything to yeah. to relearn what I had forgotten about. And Dave Beatty's documentary, that came out in uh, like 2019 or something. Uh, somewhere about there, yeah. Yeah, 1819. So, which is quite a long a time. <laughs> quite a long time after the, uh, the, the incident of 2004. That's like 15 plus years, uh, around 15 years. Uh, so you, 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 you say you didn't think about it at all in between 2004 and 2015. Um, I mean, you must have thought about it obviously, but uh, it's not, it was never to the level that obviously it is now it'd come up randomly in conversation. Um, I had random conversations with some of the other people I worked with who've honestly, one of the conversations I completely forgot I had until the guy uh, reached out to me and reminded me of the conversation we had. Um, it, it was It was a bunch of abnormal stuff that happened, Um, and I'm sure you've heard it, especially if you've talked to any or watched any of Fravor's interviews. Um, The air wing itself puts out a – it's the airplane. It's you know what's happening the next day, what flights are going out, what missions they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And there's usually a cartoon that goes along with it, and they're the most crudely drawn things, and it's normally just the air wing officers poking fun out of each other. You know, somebody okay. did something stupid. They're going to make a joke about it. And the next couple of days were all alien related. Those little cartoons, the shipboard television started playing, you know, independent. I think it was Independence Day, but all alien themed movies. And it, it became nobody quite knew what it was about, but it became a big joke. Huh. So you, you saw these these uh, videos being played like Independence Day, but you didn't know yet about the the encounters i mean i knew but the vast majority of ship had no clue i mean there would have been people on um some of the shipboard systems that had access to the outside networks that would have had a clue but an aircraft carrier of six thousand people you're probably looking at maybe 150 that had a clue what was going on but obviously the people who are in the positions to make those cartoons and kind of control stuff. They're the ones who knew. So they're the ones making a joke. Yeah. It was more the air wing that knew because the air wing was involved than most of the ship's company. So, uh, just, you just help me understand something here. Like I, I was a bit confused about the involvement of, uh, the air force, uh, do, were the air force involved in the exercise? No. Were the air force planes playing? No, all? there was, uh, it was strictly an air wing exercise there other than one of the air wing or the one of the strike group ships that was pier side in Hawaii. 
they okay. were still working with us. They were just peer side in Hawaii. There was nobody outside of uh, Strike Group 11 and Air Wing 11 that were participating in that exercise. And when we're out to sea, there's only two ways of getting on that ship. One is by COD, which is taken care of by my squadron. So I would have seen anybody coming off the back of that because I was the only one with COD experience. So I was always the one who got the uh, short straw to go up and catch. It's a C2 Greyhound. It looks very similar to a Hawkeye, except without the big dish on top, and okay. it's a little fatter. Right. It carries past 20 or so passengers and cargo. It's kind of like a shuttle type. Exactly. Plane. And the only other way besides that is helicopter. Right. The COD stands out. You're going to notice somebody getting on and off the COD because everything shuts down when that happens. You know, They come in at the end of the landing cycle, and everybody has to help unload it. Everybody sees the passengers. But the helicopters, they come on and off the deck so often throughout the day, they could have easily gotten somebody off those and nobody would have noticed. Nobody would have paid attention because hmm. they didn't show up on the cot. So I have no idea how those two officer, Air Force officers even got on board. The only thing I can think of is they came on board via helo. Yeah. And you said you you were you would normally hand over the, the data bricks, the hard drives at the end of, uh, of, of the mission. Uh, what the the exercise, uh, but you wouldn't hand them over to these Air Force people. No, normally those those bricks, um, we we call them bricks. They're basically a, a removable hard drive. Um, they're Barracuda hard drives. If you've ever heard of that brand, yeah, it, it's just a standard computer hard drive yeah. inside a fancy case. And normally right. we use those until they die, and then we replace them yeah. with something new. And um, the old ones get shredded and smashed and, and destroyed. Um, but the only time we ever send them away is for um, like special testings. If we've done a major systems upgrade, they'll ask for a set off a of flight just to help test or help check for any remaining system errors that they hadn't tested out. Um, because they have – the two groups we'd normally send them to have basically duplicates of our airplane sitting in a air-conditioned room. And they can run and test everything okay. almost identically to our airplane, which is right. why when the bug issue comes up, I get a little defensive because I know how yeah, much yeah. testing is involved before that stuff hits the fleet. Um, yeah, but because there was we this, don't normally this yeah we don't normally send them off, but this was one of the times okay. where it was kind of planned out, and it just so happens it never happened because that data got taken. Right, so you 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 were planning to hand them over because they were doing this this test of something that's classified that you can't discuss, uh, and but you think that they recorded additional information, uh, and I think specifically you mentioned somewhere else it was the uh, the ESM data. Can you explain what ESM is? Uh, much of ESM is classified, but there is a okay. bit of generic generic information you can get on Lockheed Martin's website, even Wikipedia if you look it up. Yeah. It's a passive sensor system that looks for electronic signals. Um, how it does it, how it recognizes it, and exactly what range of electronic signal it can look for is what's classified. But, I mean, as a hint, I can tell, you know, if you're running a microwave inside your house, because I'm going to pick up that electric signal. <laughs> so right. that alone should kind of give you an idea how sensitive it is. Um, we used to actually drag yeah. a microwave on a long extension cord out to tag certain antennas when we were testing it. Just oh, to, <laughs> the, well, there's a built-in test set to do the same thing, but it sucked. We got better reliability picking up a stupid microwave <laughs> than we did the actual <laughs> test set. So that is funny. Yeah. Um, no, I, I use my microwave to testing my my uh, my magic electronic uh, ghost detecting meters. <laughs> there but, you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but. but you know, the radar on a Hawkeye then, for as old as it was, was a very, very good radar. But it's a, it's a pulse Doppler radar. It's an older style radar. You know, it spins. Hmm. You know, I can get into a lot of technical jargon, but for as good as it is, it's not going to hold a constant track on something moving as fast as a Tic Tac was. Right. Or as we believe we think it is. It, it held slower targets. It held the the reigning UFO-type style 
that Kevin Day described, I've been told they were tracking those and they were tracking it intermittently. But when they were constantly picking it up, it was via ESM, which means that object was transmitting some sort of electronic signal that they were able to pick up. So I believe that is why they went after those bricks and that's what the information they wanted. Do you know if, if it was picking up ESM data like before the 14th, before the actual encounter with Flavor? Um, like when you know, Kevin describes it as this being several days of their things drifting down the screen, just radar contacts, but there was no I've intercepts. Spoken at, I've spoken at length with the crew that was airborne during Flavor's flight, and I've spoken with a few other officers that I've remained friends with over the years who were airborne throughout that time, and those objects were on and off our on and off our scopes intermittently throughout that whole period, just like they were the mm. Princeton. Um, because for the most part, when our systems are on, they don't discriminate. It's not like we only look at one small slice of the sky. It, it's looking everywhere. Right. So even if we're, you know, 200 miles away over here on, on this training mission, it's still picking up everything. So if it's in that airspace, they're going to see it. So I have no way of physically confirming it because I can't see the data. I can't do any of that stuff. But I am being told by the crews that were flying that they were on and off uh, tracking these objects throughout the week. Okay. Uh, so, you know what you described about the you know, the older radar not being the same, as good as the Princeton's radar. That kind of ties into uh, like what happened with Fravor's intercept, where uh, I think initially yeah. Fravor was there's being a, and there's a huge difference controlled. between the, the the radar on like Fravor's fighter. Those radars that were in his plane, as brand new as the Super Hornets were then, have already been replaced. They were never meant to be the permanent radar in a Super Hornet. They were basically a stopgap. They're not meant. They're meant to track a plane to fire a missile and get that missile from the the rail on Fravor's fighter to whatever target he's shooting. They're not meant to search for. Um, yeah, they're not meant to search for like a body in the water. They're not meant to search for ballistic missiles. They're not meant to do all that. Princeton was designed to track ballistic missiles. That's its primary purpose. It just so happens that radar, because it can do that, can do so much more. You know, the Hawkeye's radar is meant for airspace control. It's supposed to see everything. You know, it does that very well. You know, a Hawkeye I've seen pick up driftwood at, you know, well over 250 miles. And if you see a piece of driftwood floating on the surface of the ocean, you can see how small it is and tells you how good that radar actually is. But it's not meant to del- it's it's not meant to track a ballistic missile. You know that's why the speed it will eventually outdo that radar's capabilities. Whereas the Princeton is meant for that speed, it's going to track that object a lot better that way. Okay, but. Uh... The so with Fravor, Fravor's out there doing his exercise. Uh, him and his wingman. So there's you know four people. They, in total, they were essentially doing uh, good guy versus bad guy, and they go out and dogfight with each other. With if each other. Heard, okay. Yeah. Um, they were doing two v two, which is I- exactly. Um, they discussed two marine pilots that were airborne. Um, around that same time, Commander Co- or uh, Colonel Cooth or Lieutenant Colonel Cooth, I can't remember the dude's name, but it starts with a K. Um, they were actually supposed to be Fravor and his wingman's opponents for that training evolution. And the Hawkeye obviously controls everything going on in that airspace, unless somebody specific requests otherwise, which in this case was Kevin Day and the Princeton. The Hawkeye then turned. Fravor and his wingman over to the Princeton, and the Princeton was then controlling those. But no air wing asset is airborne without being controlled by the Hawkeye or the Princeton. And most of the time, it is the Hawkeye. We are always airborne. Okay, okay, so that makes sense. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and so, very specifically with with Fravor's encounter, uh, uh, the way Kevin remembers it, uh, he decided he wanted to intercept uh, this this group of five uh, things that he saw on the scope. And he knew that Fravor was out there. And uh, But at the time, 
the Hawkeye didn't have uh, these targets on their scope. To my knowledge, no, I believe you're correct. We, we did not see him at that exact point. It, it, at some point, I don't have a timeline, at some point during that flight, um, Dave Beatty and I were told by the individual we've called Roger, because we're not going to reveal his actual name. At some point during that flight, the tic-tac object or a tic-tac object i don't know if it's the identical one the same one but one of those objects got real close to the hawkeye basically came up said hi and then took off um okay and that was during that was this about the same time as fravers and during like i said i don't have the exact yeah middle of the flight end of the flight but during that flight and it's a three and a half hour or so block of time that that all happened. Yeah. So at some point during that, one of those objects came up and said hi to the Hawkeye and then took off. And if you, I just shared Roger's quote on Twitter right before we hopped on. Oh yeah. So. And what, what, what was that? Um, or, well, roughly. <laughs> I'm actually going to, I've still got it up. I was going to, I'll read it directly better than me trying to. Dave Bates is quoting the email between him and Roger. Um, okay. But he says, basically, first off, I did see something that transited very quickly by our E2, and I cannot honestly say I've seen anything like it. The object Mm. joined up with us briefly, and all on board had a view. Upon arrival back to the Nimitz, we were told to follow an individual down for a debriefing. We made our way to a secure area on the ship where the events were discussed individually, and then they were told it did not happen. And Roger is one of the crew who signed the NDA, so obviously that's why he's not elaborating any more on uh, what he actually saw. Now, this this NDA that that they signed, do you think that was to do with the object or to do with these the the other stuff that you you talked about? I, I think it's a combination of all of it. If you've ever seen a government NDA, it's a very bland, basic document. Right. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many I've signed, and most of them just have to deal with my basic security clearance or certain programs I worked on while I was in the Navy. It's basically a catch-all. What makes the NDA, um, what makes an actual NDA, is the briefing that comes along with it. It's, okay. It's it's what they say that they don't write down that actually is more critical than what's on that piece of paper. Because mm-hmm. they will literally say, "You can say this. You can say this. You can say this. You cannot say this. You cannot say this. You cannot say this." Right. And that's what would have happened in. Again, I was not in their debrief. I was not privy to it. They have not elaborated on what they were told or what they couldn't say. Um, I've pushed – I'm going to say I pushed the limits of my friendship with Roger to try and get him to share more than he can. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you, you want know, to know. I- exactly. It's, but uh, you know, I do respect why he sticks by his NDA. I do respect why he doesn't yeah. want to come forward. You know, I know – what job he presently does and an error in any of this could seriously affect what he does. Not that he is would he do still... anything intentionally. He is not still in the Navy. He has gotten out, but he does okay. work in the defense industry. Gotten out. You make it sound like it's uh, some kind of, <laughs> some kind of uh, ordeal being in the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it can be. All right. All right, so let's get back to Fravor and uh, the, the Fravor encounter. Um, yes. One of the things like, that Kevin Day mentioned about uh, these radar contacts, like before, just directly before Fravor's encounter, we'll get to that in a second, was that he was told that there were uh, the ballistic missile tracking uh, system was detecting them coming down from space uh, through 60,000 feet or through 80,000 feet. Uh, and then coming down to the surface of the water. Is that Correct. something that you have, you have heard? I, I, I mean, I've, is... the, the group of us, myself, Gary, Kevin, <clears throat> Jason, we, we've all obviously talked at length and we, you know, talk via text message and Facebook message right. and who knows however else, whatever else Gary decided today we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> he's he's uh, the instigator my, of these discussions. <clears throat> he is. He, he's, he's more of the... Uh, I'm going to stick to it and get it done kind of guy than the rest of us. Right. Um, but my last uh, in-person Kevin uh, discussion with Kevin was actually in Brooklyn, I don't know, probably seven months ago now. Um, 
the rain. I hate to, I hate to even correct Kevin because he's not wrong in what he says. Mm-hmm. It's just I don't know if he used the best choice of words to yeah. say what he said. You know, there's no reason to doubt that they were way up high coming down. You know, that's the that's you know the range of spy one. That's where it's supposed to look. That's where ballistic missiles travel is way up high. You know, so I have every confidence that that's where they were trapped. I don't know if that's where they started versus where that's where they were tracked from. That's right. my only that's my only heartache with his whole statement. It's just I don't know if, you know, some people say, well, that's where they started tracking them. Well, that means it came from outer space. I don't necessarily know if that means outer space. That just means that's where we started tracking them. Yeah, I think outer space is quite a bit higher than 80,000 feet. So. Exactly. It's could they have come from outer space? Hypothetically, yes, but it just <clears throat> people I can't that, take what he said as that's where they started. You yeah. know, he could have tracked them at max range of spy one, and that's where he started to see them. But that does not mean that's where they they started. It's just like a Hawkeye radar; it's got a very large range. The further out you get, the less accurate it is. Right, and it's it's the same with any radar system, no yeah, matter what pal- technology it is. The further you get to the end of the range, the harder it is for you to be as accurate as you were close up. Just like the objection you have with the FLIR video is, he was mm-hmm. at max range. It's a lot harder to be as accurate with that FLIR at max range than it is at mid range or up close. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh- with this, you know, the ballistic thing, I think this was something that Kevin didn't observe himself. It was something that somebody told him later uh, that he he said. So it's not, you know, directly from the horse's mouth. Uh, but, you know, if, if something like that is happening, and this is kind of a more general question uh, to do with, like, all the events of the day, do you think that... Um, what do you think of the response from, from command, basically, uh, as what was going on because it's been described as as like an act of war uh with with radar jamming and things like that i i mean hypothetically that if you if you look at the basic description of what an act of war is you know some of the events that happened do fr- do actually fit that criteria um an unknown when we're doing training exercises what we're doing is not publicized but where we are it's not a secret. Where we operate, it's not a secret. You know, all of that area is annotated on almost any fishing map or any map you're going to find saying, stay the heck out. You know, it's it's devoid of air corridors for that same reason. There's no reason the civilian airplane is even going to get close to that without, you know, drastically being off course. Um, that area is set aside for us to safely yeah. operate without interfering with, you know, civilian fishing boats or civilian aircraft because you're not going to want a civilian 737 flying right through the middle of a dogfight with four f 18 something bad's going to happen it's yeah it's our way of protecting ourselves and everybody else that's why those operating areas exist you know they exist there they exist off the east coast they exist in a lot of places for us to safely train and it's not just us. Canada has their own. Mexico has their own. You know, a lot of the country with ma- countries with major navies all have their little safe operating areas for the military to train. Right. So when something that's not supposed to be in that area ends up in that area, a lot of red flags are thrown. You know, people get on alert. People are notified. So, so that's- but the way that Kevin describes it. Uh- is that there were these constant groups popping up over Catalina Island in the north and then flying south at 100 knots, which is about wind speed uh, at that altitude, and then disappearing off uh, Guadalupe uh, in the south. And when they did this, they they traveled right through the operations area. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't they have been immediately intercepted the very first time that happened? You would think so. 
I would think so. In practice, I believe that's how it should happen. But there's a lot of decision making and a lot of when we're in a when we're in the Persian Gulf, we always have alert aircraft set if we're not flying. They can get a jet off the deck in seven minutes or even less if they had to. There's somebody sitting in a fighter jet, fully armed, ready to go and protect us if we had to. When we're training, unless they're specifically training for that status, for an alert status, we don't have alert fighters set. It's going to take a lot more than, you know, seven minutes to get an aircraft loaded with weapons and off that deck. We don't right. react the same way in a training area as we do in a a war zone or an open ocean zone. So there's a, an obvious delay in reacting to anything. Yeah. So do, do you think it was the case that initially it was assumed that these were radar glitches? I'm sure it so was. Because right. for, you know, the Princeton is essentially designed around that spy one radar. That radar is why that whole boat exists practically. Obviously, it's got other missions and other capabilities, but that's its biggest asset. That's what it's for. For them to take that radar offline and you know check it and go through it and bring it back online, which is what Gary did, they think something was wrong. There, there's mm-hmm. no doubt about that. Gary will even tell you that they thought that those were – errors in the radar essentially and that's why they shut it down and restarted everything when they brought it up the problem was now those tracks that were um you know 50 or 60 percent quality were now 90 to 100 percent quality and it's hard to deny that once you shut it down and brought it back up you're now seeing all these things better than you were before and it's somewhere around there that kevin was then able to convince his commanding officer to, to get some fighters to go look at this stuff. It's quite a while, though. It was about, I don't know, seven days or so of, yep, of observing these so. things. Yeah. The, the, the problem was, is it's not that they were in our area or that we were traveling through it. They weren't bothering us. They weren't endangering anybody. They weren't, they weren't encroaching on us exactly. Um, we were down in the off area. Mexico. In the area, yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, I've, so at I've, some point, I've somewhere, somebody around. made a decision not to do anything, you know. But that's that's way above my head. That's way above yeah. Gary's head. That's even way above Kevin's head. So I suppose that kind of leads to like, is this a clue? Uh, oh, is yes. this is this a clue that it it was actually something that the powers that be, like the captain, uh, actually knew what it it actually was? You know, it's. I've been asked more than once if I believe that they would test something of ours against us without telling us. The answer is yes. I've watched them do it. Um, Hmm. I've seen it. I've participated in it. Just because I don't know or just because Kevin doesn't know or Fravor even doesn't know doesn't mean the admiral in charge of the strike group doesn't know. Right. You know. That's interesting. Cause I, I the think only some... people who would have be been told in something like that are the actual absolute critical people who needed to know. Mm-hmm. And Fravor had no reason to know. Um, my skipper had no reason to know. You know, we were out there training for deployment. That was our priority. That's what we needed to do. So if they wanted to run something through our area to just check on their systems or test something yeah. um, it wouldn't they wouldn't need to tell everybody they'd need to tell a select few group of people and that's all who would know so it's very possible they could have been testing something on us and that's why I lean towards it being something of ours and I do it being extraterrestrial yeah. it's because I've seen them test it I've participated testing you know I spent three days sitting in a trailer somewhere on the east coast watching the Learjet go up and down the coast playing a bad gun just as testing. But the only people who knew what that Learjet were doing were maybe six of us. You know, okay. it was traveling over naval stations and over carrier strike groups. It was doing stuff, but everybody doesn't know. Yeah, you know, because yeah. they have no need to know. It's not endangering them. It's not hurting them. It's not going to interfere with what they're doing. 
So yeah, if something like that is happening, and yeah, this 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 experiment or whatever is flying over the the top of the group, wouldn't there be a way for if someone had concerns to you know kind of escalate the inquiry and uh, and and ask like, are you yes. testing something in the area? The question is if anybody thought to even ask that. Mm. Um, but it would go up the chain of command. It would have gone from essentially. Kevin Day raised a concern. Kevin went to his commanding officer. His commanding officer didn't just say, okay, you can take control of those fighters. At some point, he checked with somebody to get that decision made. Okay. And he would have gone to whoever's right above him, somebody in the strike group. And somebody in that strike group might have already known what was going on and said, go ahead, or might have asked somebody else. But they would have gone up the, the chain of command until they reached somebody who had a clue what was going on. And it would have either kept going up till they found somebody or it would have been stopped at some point because somebody knew what was going on. Or it's entirely possible nobody knew what's going on and that's why they gave the the, the okay to go look at these yeah. things and see what they are. Yeah. So if Freyfer goes out there and looks at these these things, so he gets it gets vectored out to it uh by the Princeton, by by Kevin essentially, or Kevin's uh controller guy. Uh, and then they arrive there and uh there's some uh discrepancies you know did you did you see the whole thing i did with kevin i have watched a good portion of it okay so uh, kevin describes the initial encounter a bit differently to how Fravo describes it and i mean obviously you you wouldn't be able to resolve this but it's kind of is this something you've talked about with 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 kevin and the guys about these differences like kevin describes it as they that when when Fravo arrives there the object is actually at his altitude and then the object flies down and then Fravor follows it down, which is a bit different to Fravor. Uh, I hate to say it. None of us believe Fravor is lying. You know, we, we've talked about that man at length. We've tried to reach out to him. We've tried to talk to him. He wants nothing to do with us. All right, we all yeah. came out to support what he said. We all opened our mouths because we saw what he was doing and we wanted to obviously not directly support him, but support the whole narrative of what had happened to get to the truth. You know, that's why any of us have opened our mouths. It's Fravor is looking at it from one point of view. Mm-hmm. Kevin is looking at it from an entire different point of view. And the two of them have two complete set, completely different sets of training behind how they make their observations. They're not going to look at the situation exactly the same. And they're not going to recall it exactly the same. Even though it may be the exact situation that happened, they're not going to say it the same way because they have two different ways of looking at everything. Yeah, yeah. Kevin has an advantage. Kevin actually went to Top Gun. Kevin got a good chunk of that pilot, not the direct pilot training, but a good chunk of learning what those pilots did and saw and how they observe things. Fravor has no idea what Kevin's job is. Fravor has no idea how Kevin does his job. Fravor has no idea how Kevin is going to interpret any of that. All he knows about Kevin Day is he's the guy I'm talking to on the other end of the radar, and I'm just supposed to essentially do what he tells me unless it's going to endanger my aircraft. That's what Fravor knows about Kevin. So it's not that either of them are wrong. It's they're looking at it from two different points of view. So there's going to be some variation in what they've said. Yeah, but, but this particular variation wasn't just like Kevin's perspective. This is Kevin remembering what Fravor told him uh, later when they were back at the beach. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a difference in recollection, really, really and difference yeah. in perspective. Uh, on that particular thing, which is quite understandable, I must say, over such a long it's, time. and It's been, what, 14 years now, give or take, yeah. 15, somewhere in there. I would like to think everything I say is as accurate as it was, you know, when the event happened. But I know I've gotten some details wrong here and there. I correct myself when I know for a fact that I said something wrong. And it's not the yeah. first time I've corrected myself. You know, it's... There are certain parts of the story that I just didn't remember. The only way I know the details is because I've spoken with other people to kind of fill in the blanks to what I know. 
Yeah, it's a shame that Fravor won't uh, won't really talk to more people outside of uh, you know the, the kind of the high profile interviews he's done. I, I think it'd be good Fravor's to get people number. together. I've got his home address and his email. I haven't called him because you know I don't want to be rude to the <laughs> yeah. guy. But I sent him a very nice, polite email saying, "Hey, you're not far from me. It's a couple hour drive. I I will grab a case of beer. I will come up. I will, you know, we can talk about it." nothing no expectations about anything but we just want to you know learn and reach yeah. out so you know <laughs> there's more than just you but you know he he just wants nothing to do with us for some reason yeah it's just a shame uh because and my uh, big issue with fravor is not that he doesn't want to talk to us is he a, while, a long time ago spoke to paco Chikari. i can never say his mm-hmm. last name and now so paco like goes everywhere and and, and and retells Fravor's story, but he's got nothing to do with it. And people take his word as, you know, gospel, and it drives me nuts. Right. You know, Paco, it, it's kind of funny. When I first reached out to Dave Beatty, I only reached out to him because he, he said at the end of his documentary, his initial version, you know, hey, if you know anything, reach out. And, you know, I just wanted to reach out and say, hey, you know, here's a short, little tiny part of the story you don't know. Yeah. And that's how I got involved, and he then put me in touch with Gary and Kevin and everybody. Um, but when I initially did that, it's I'm trying to remember what I was going to say or how I was going to say uh, it. Paco. Yeah, when he Fravor or uh, Dave Beatty didn't want to just take my word for it. He he wanted to try and essentially make me prove I knew what I was mm-hmm. saying and that I was I was authentic and I don't blame him you know you don't want to just take you know anybody's word for it you want to get some kind of verification that's how he got in touch with Roger I put him in touch with Roger so he could essentially independently verify you know everything I was saying so he's not just taking my word for it but in our initial conversations I would kind of tell Dave Beatty something he'd come back to me and say well Paco said there's no windows in a Hawkeye. Well, really? that that that's almost a direct quote. I simply sent Dave back a video of not only the windows in the back of the Hawkeye being open, because they're little flaps. You can close the windows in the back of the Hawkeye. Yeah. When the radar's operating, they normally have those windows closed, but it, they can be open. So I sent him a video of those windows being open. You know, Everything I was telling Dave, Dave was trying to verify. Paco kept telling him I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. And I just kept sending Dave Beatty photo or video or evidence to support what I was saying. And that's why I don't like Paco being involved in any of this because all he wants to do is believe Fravor and say what Fravor said. Right. But that was a little Yeah, it's a shame. I apologize it's for that. It's a shame that it's uh, – <laughs> no, that's just fine. It's uh, like, you know, obviously uh, – there's lots of different people involved in this uh, and uh, lots of different opinions. And I think it's, it's, it would be good if we could have them get together and talk about it. And I know you've, you've been in uh, discussions where it's like, but it's like you and the guys, like you and Gary and, uh, and Kevin Day. And then kind of on the other side, you've got like uh, Fravor and Chad Underwood. Uh, and, you know, I've tried to talk to them because... I mean, I'll be honest, I, Chad Underwood basically... We he did reach out to us and we did have a very short collective discussion with him through Dave Beatty. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least I think it was through Dave. It was through somebody at this point. But he just wanted to get his portion of the story out and be done with it. He didn't want to keep going with it. He didn't want to you know keep discussing yeah. it. Um, but he at least spoke to us, even if it was briefly. So I'll give him that much. And like the female fighter pilot, I know for a fact of who that is. I've had many conversations with that lady on the ship. Oh yeah. Um, but again, doesn't want to come forward. Um, I know the entire Hawkeye crew and who was flying, and none of them want to come forward because they don't want to deal with any of the potential repercussions for the things that they are currently doing. Well, they they've obviously signed an NDA as well. But the the female pilot, do you know what her her reason is exactly? I mean, I've heard that she's got a you know she's got a high power job or something or that, a, a, that's a position. The, 
that's the simplest explanation for it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I heard that explanation from her before when, you know, I first got involved and then she decided with Fravor's pushing as far as I can tell to do unidentified. Hmm. Um, but they obviously kept her identity secret. But I'll be yeah. brutally honest, if someone took the time to figure out who she is, it's very easy to do. Yeah, no, nobody I nobody just wants I to put two and two together to what Yeah. It's and just nobody well, wants to find yeah. that out. No. And everyone's being very polite and uh, it's yep. great. And I that's, think that, yeah, that's all we can request uh, is respecting her privacy. I, I did email her asking her uh if she would uh you know be interviewed anonymously, but you know, she, she never responded, which is, you know, it's fine. It's understandable. People don't want to uh, get involved in things like this because in a way it's, it's a media circus. And I know, uh, was it um, Commander Slay? Uh, Jim Slate, yep. Slate, right. Yeah, he he was he was the, the wizzo on Fravor's plane, the weapon systems operator. And I think he went on this one Fox News interview, but it was kind of almost like a hit piece because the guy interviewing them did this this silly thing beforehand where he was making jokes about aliens. Uh, and, oh yeah, and they just. It didn't I mean, I'll come be honest. I've well done what two television shows now. One being identified, which was season two, and the other was the one William Shatner does. Hmm. The only reason I agree to do unidentified aside from the fact that Gary and Kevin had already done it, was I wanted to have a sit-down conversation with Lou. Right. And my conversation yeah. with Lou Elizondo was a lot longer than what was shown and how they portrayed it on the TV. I don't really care how they portrayed it on the TV. I wanted the conversation with Lou, and I got several answers that I hadn't gotten before directly from Lou through that. And, Anything you can share? Uh, I mean, it's nothing secret. I've shared it before. Okay. You know, I never knew where... My bricks went. Other than they got taken, I never knew where they went. Lou did. Lou knew the answer. He knew exactly where they went. He knew exactly what I was talking about before mm. I even broached the subject. They were taken and they were used to make um, briefings for senior DOD officials. He wouldn't tell me exactly who was briefed. Can't blame him. It's probably not something he's supposed to share. But the mm. fact that he knew and he was able to tell me in such a way that he knew what was on those bricks and he wouldn't have known what was on those bricks if he didn't actually know what happened to them because it's not mm -hmm. something that he would have just known. Um, and so then did he you, know the classified portion that you were discussing yeah. earlier? Like I said, he knew, he knew the answers that he shouldn't have known if he didn't actually have access to those at some point. So right. it was... Like I said, I wanted the conversation with Lou. I could have cared less about the television. I mean, it was a novelty. It was nice. It was kind of fun. But I wanted the conversation with Lou Elizondo. Yeah. Um, I swear, but, at that time... Oh, so go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, so at that time, Lou was still part of To The Stars Academy, uh, which is the Tom DeLong and, and others organization which in, in in a large part i think is is responsible for the the media interest because they they promoted stuff and they they essentially worked with uh leslie keen and uh, ralph blumenthal at the new york times and doing the publicity uh what what's your opinion of to the stars academy like i guess then and now because now they've kind of uh, broken up a little bit I said, now I have no clue what to tell you about them. Right. But then it was, they at least had an objective to try and, I never quite had a solid grasp on what their overall intention was. But through them, a lot of information was able to be released. A lot of information was able to be discovered. Even if they didn't do the direct work themselves, you know, guys like Dave Beatty and Tim McMillan wouldn't have been able to dig up a lot of the information they had without at least to the stars starting. Right. You know, I, I have no idea what their, like I said, overall mission was or what their intention was or what their goal was. I don't really care. Um, yeah. But they got a lot of this started in my opinion. And that's a good thing. 
Yeah, well, it's certainly been very interesting <laughs> because of them. And uh, uh, you know, essentially, it's the the three videos. Yes. But then, you know, Fravor's video and Fravor's account was actually out there before uh, TTSA came along. They just kind of bumped it up in the public awareness and oh, yes. made it more real, I think, by by uh, you know having some kind of official link with uh, you know, and eventually getting the Navy to admit that the they were actually Navy videos. Like I said, I think they just lended some credibility to it all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, with Underwood's encounter, Underwood was the guy who filmed the the whole thing, mm. uh, filmed the you know, the famous video of this little rather fuzzy thing in the distance, uh, which is a subject of great debate, which I'm I, I contribute to quite a bit with my oh yeah my my yeah, YouTube that, analyses. That is honestly something that needs to be debated. I don't necessarily agree with everything that certain people have said, but. The only way we're going to get to the truth about that is by dissecting it as much as we are. Yeah. Which is kind of one yeah. of the reasons you and I hope definitely don't agree on everything. That's <laughs> that's not a secret to anybody who's followed Twitter. But you've at least tried to stay relatively grounded in your in your intention to figure out what that object is. You know, yeah. Versus you. some other uh, people who are just throwing wild accusations out there. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I, I'm, I would admit that, like the Navy, I have not identified these objects. Uh, I've just, you know, essentially put out you know, hypotheses as to what I think they might be, and I, I guess, pointed out things that other people have claimed that I think are wrong. Like with with Underwood's video, and this is something that Underwood himself believes is that at the end of the video, uh, when it goes off to the left, he's saying that's because it accelerated very rapidly to the left. And I say that uh, that's not the case. And it was actually because uh, uh, the camera stopped tracking because he switched video modes and uh, that changes the alignment of the camera slightly. And, and, and both and are it, it entirely left. possible. Yeah. And the, it would be good, I think, to... In, the only difference in interpretation, not that you're wrong or not that he's right, is he has the operator experience to go along with right. that video when he makes his discussion, which is something you and I, neither of us have. I mean, I know a good deal about that system just because of, of learning about it and talking to guys who worked on it, but I still don't have that same experience with it that he does. Mm -hmm. But both what he said and what you said are both completely possible. You know, he stated many times that he was flipping through modes, trying to get anything he could on it, you know, that doesn't yeah, necessarily see mean that. he's yeah he's not going to get the best of anything going through it so quickly, and it very well could be that when he switched that last time it, it lost track it lost all of that just like you said yeah it could be a combination it could have gone fast and lost track it could have just gone fast you never know that's it's one of those answers I don't think we're truly going to get I don't think we're truly going to get the full answer to to, to that. My, my feeling with that is that I think if we do, like you said, do a bit more digging into it, uh, I think we could perhaps you know, resolve some of the, the disagreements. And the attempts to um, dig into it as kind of rebuttals to what I've been saying, I, I don't really think uh, stand up. Like, like Underwood did actually give an interview with Jeremy Corbell, and I just listened to that yesterday again. And it was very, very disjointed interview because it was quite highly edited but you know basically uh, uh, I think Jeremy Corbell kind of asked the wrong questions there this is something I've discussed on other videos that you know he asked was it the change to two times zoom that made it lose the lock when it, it that wasn't what I was saying it's actually the change between I think uh, the narrow mode and the wide field of view mode uh, so we're not really we're kind of like talking past each other which is something Lex Fridman said, and that we're not really talking directly. And I think it would be great to have people who know what they're talking about with this system uh, actually uh, I mean, discuss. I can, like, I, can, I can answer one one plausible thing put put out by more than one person. I think you're one of them. It's not an airplane. Mm. They're too many right. things that would have to fail for an airplane to get anywhere near them without us knowing about it. Yeah. It would have to get by the airborne Hawkeye. 
It would have to get by the air radars on the Nimitz. It would have to get by the air radars on the Princeton. It would have to get by the Spy-1 radar on the Princeton. It would have to get by many, many civilian air traffic control radars Yeah. to even get close to us. I, I would agree with all Any, of that, except for the first part. I, uh, you said it, it's not an airplane, and then you're saying that if it was an airplane, it would be on the radar. My, 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 my theory here is that it was on the radar, but what he was pointing his camera at uh, was something that was on the radar, but his estimation of where that actually was was not uh, was a kind of a bit of empty space on the radar, and the actual object was either further away or, or closer, probably further away. That's possible, but that means it'd be a huge screw up on Underwood's part. Yeah, because... I don't know about huge, but certainly a <laughs> bit of a screw up. <laughs> well, uh, you're just looking at it from a different point of view than I am. Yeah, you know, every military aircraft in that area. The ID of that aircraft and what it is and who it is and all that is well established. You know, they brief on who else is going to be in the air. They know, you know, they may not know exactly what the other group of fighters is training on, but they know there's another group of fighters over there training and it should be six jets and they're doing three versus three. They know who else is in there. They deconflict mm -hmm. the airspace. So they're all in their own little areas. They're all training. The Hawkeye alone knows everything. <laughs> you know, every fighter automatically tells the Hawkeye who it is. The Hawkeye is smart enough to know what that fighter is, even if the fighter turned its shit off. You know, yeah. you've got more than one system that identifies every air wing aircraft up there. You know, the, the fighters have mids, the Hawkeye's got JTIDs, there's basically as simple as IFF, which even in training, every jet's got mode four going, which is um, IFF. If you look it up, it's essentially good guy, bad guy. You know, yeah. every jet's got a code in it that says, hey, I'm a good guy, and it automatically pops up on all those other systems, and it's all tied into each other. When I say if he was tracking a jet that was identified with his FLIR, he basically lost all his situational awareness and he made a mistake tracking something that he already knew what it was. You know, he would have been able to, um, just on his mid systems alone, which is a distributed data link. Um, it's got a slower update rate than say CEC does, but all the fighters have it and they're all tied into the network with the Hawkeye, with the ship, you know, there's such a giant battle group picture painted yeah, yeah. that they have access to. That's why I say if he was tracking something that we had already identified, he made a giant mistake going after. Well, him. I think yeah, Chad Underwood as as uh, someone asked him if he would come on my podcast and he uh, refused emphatically. So I don't think he's ever going to do it. Uh, so I I think. I think actually he did make a mistake, and I, I think this kind of shows up a little bit in in the video and the way it ends. And at the end of the video, he is zoomed in all the ways in the narrow field of view and two times zoom. So he's got this very and, and very the very last thing he does is, is switch to two times zoom, which makes the object go off the side even quicker. Uh, and then he loses the object and doesn't reacquire it, but. All he would have to do to reacquire it would be just to switch to the wild field, field of view, because it's, it's super zoomed in. It's got this, this tiny little patch of the sky he's looking at, and this object which has moved relatively slowly. Which is a very correct statement, off. unless that object actually took off as fast as he said it did. If it but took he, off as fast he as he said to, it did, he wouldn't be able even to see backing that, it out. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not by any means confirming what he said. I'm just saying, if you're right, if he backed out and essentially maybe repositioned his jet a little, he should have easily been able to retrack it. Yeah, but, but you wouldn't even object... need to reposition his jet because it's, it's, the camera can go from there to there pretty much. And he, he's, he was almost like looking straight ahead at this point. And the object was basically just you know essentially one degree 
to the left. So it's a tiny, yeah, I mean, tiny that, little movement. That's, that's information I don't know for sure. That's the only reason yeah. I'm saying it the way I'm saying it. But if he had backed out and, like you suspect, it was still right there, yeah, he could have reacquired it. But at the same time, if he backed out and it had already hightailed it out of the area, backing it out wouldn't have done any good. Yeah, but he never even talks about that. He doesn't talk about backing yeah. out. Uh, and in, in the early reports, uh, there's this this written report, I think, which includes an interview with him. I think this is the the longer executive report, which isn't, like yeah, you say, it's not I have a real... A lot of issues with that. Yeah, but uh, what, what, what it says there... There's and missing information. It seems like there's a direct interview with him in that, though. The, the problem with that whole document is it's not an official Navy document. Yeah. No official Navy document in the world, no military document in the world of the United States military will ever reference Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will reference the, you know, the type equipment manual for that aircraft. It will reference some other Navy document or other military document. It will never, ever <laughs> reference Wikipedia. That so, document a was done several years later. So there could be, you know, already errors in it from that yeah there are people involved that are interviewed in there there are people interviewed in there that were not involved and there are flat out parts of it that are just missing that have that they didn't even touch on well do you do you know if if they actually interviewed underwood for it though because it it seems like i have no reason to doubt it i know for a fact they the, the the individual speaking for the hawkeye Mm-hmm. Um, that they, I mean, I'm not going to list any names because most people yeah. don't know the version with the names in it. Um, but that person had nothing to do with it and was more clueless than, you know, the average Twitter user about what actually happened. You know, somebody, yes. whoever, you know, what squadrons were in that whole situation is public knowledge. You know, it takes two seconds of Googling to figure out what, mm-hmm. what squadrons are on that ship. And it doesn't take much for anybody whoever actually wrote that document to be able to say okay well let me call VAW 117 the Hawkeye squadron and actually try and find somebody who was there maybe they'll talk to me yeah. you know and the person they were directed to like I said had no clues so I don't trust to that document whatsoever not saying yeah, that uh, what's in there may not be accurate or may not be you know usable it's just there's no proof of you know a lot of people want the actual hard documentation. That's not hard documentation. That could have been made up by anybody for all we know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what I would love to do is get Underwood and sit him down and go through the video with him, like frame by frame. But I, I really that, don't that think he's going to do that. Thing. Yeah. But he's, he's, he seems very uh, aggressively not wanting to do anything like that, which is, which is unfortunate, really. And I think a the, lot of the time, the like. Ideal, the ideal way for for you or somebody with your point of view to really get to the bottom of that video is to literally get in touch with an engineer for at FLIR, somebody yeah. who flat out worked. To, I realize how impossible that is, but somebody <sighs> who actually, you know, designed and worked on that system and knows it in and out better than even the pilots. They're the ones who are going to be able to give the most educated answer as to what happened. Yeah, I did actually talk to one. Uh, <laughs> I talked to one anonymous person who was a guy who did uh, maintenance on. I don't think it was even the Aplio system, but it was a very similar uh, system. Yeah, there's a couple you know, of different the, versions. Yeah, the, basically the the same technology, and and he kind of more or less agreed with me and said, yeah, this is what happens. And even like with the gimbal thing, with the the glare, the rotating glare, he says that's something that happens when uh, someone tries to clean the front screen and it gets streaks on it and you get these oh, yeah. kind of blur shapes. And where where like they that. stick those pods, it gets all kinds of crap on them. Yeah. <laughs> so they, yeah. they clean and, them all the time. Yeah. So he, he says that the, the, the explanation I gave of the gimbal system made sense. And he wasn't really that familiar with the, uh, the, the flu one, one, the, uh, the Nimitz uh, Tic Tac video, but he, he kind of more or less agreed with me, but you know, he's an, an, he's an anonymous guy. He didn't want to come forward. And this is the problem that you have. That was like the only guy I could, I've, been able to get because no one wants to talk uh, because they're all bound by NDAs because this is this is 
sensitive technology. So it's, it's this very surprising. frustrating wall of secrecy that we have that we, we can never get through. I mean, I, I get blasted almost every time I say that about, you know, not wanting to, to violate my security clearance or yeah. an NDA I've signed or just flat out share tactics that would endanger somebody. Um, it's like the weapons and tactics that we use on a Hawkeye. They're not all classified, but they're not exactly public knowledge. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. You know, I'm always going to err on the side of caution with what I say. And I, I promise anybody who watches your, your show and or listening to this, I would much rather just tell you everything I know and not have to walk that line because it would be so much easier. There's a lot of information I have access to and I know that answers a lot of questions, but I essentially have to play stupid because I can't say anything about it. Yeah, it's you know, unfortunate. Yeah. There's and <laughs> even the, the 2015 incident with the gimbal and all that, I have nothing to do with that. But somebody who was on that ship, on that Hawkeye, in that squadron, used to be my roommate. <laughs> Hmm. You know, I've had a conversation with him. I know some information about that. I can't say diddly. I can say I know something, but I can't say anything because right. the Hawkeye they have, for lack of a better term, is twice as classified as the one I worked on. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's just a fact of life for those of us who have to deal with that. Trust me, we would all rather just say what we know, you know, because yeah. a little tidbit that I share or could share may give somebody like you the ability to, oh, now I can go find this answer. But the problem is I can't share that tidbit. You're never going to get connected with that random answer. It's it's just a fact of life I hate. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. And uh, this is unfortunately something that occurs a lot in the, the more general UFO field is that a lot of these things are behind a wall of secrecy. Uh, and like the TTSA stuff, you know, essentially it's like, poking some holes in this this wall and showing you some fascinating little tidbit but there's almost no context and then the navy gives you these these uh, boilerplate statements which aren't really helpful at all and then it just They're kind of that oh yeah <laughs> just repeating the same thing over and over again that's uh yeah that's that's their job so and you know I think that a lot of the time they uh, would rather the UFO people just kind of go away because they they just you know they're, they're either hovering around the edges of something that's classified or they're just kind of wasting their time with with stuff that's that's, that's irrelevant but they can't talk about either one so it's it must be annoying for for them as uh, as spokespeople all right uh so What's going on with the uh, UAP expeditions? We, um, we have kind of stepped back and regrouped. Um, we had some people associated with us who, not that they're bad people at any, any, they're all highly talented people, but because of the coronavirus, our initial mm -hmm. plan of going out on the ship and, and actual doing hard science off of Catalina and that whole area where all this happened it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, or never, as much or as just... we want it to. Yeah. Um, so we're, we, we're, we're dropping back. We're regrouping. Um, we want to get some... We're, we don't want to speculate. We don't want to guess. We don't want to do any of that. We want to try and get some hard science, mm -hmm. some hard data that people can then work with. And one of the ways we want to do that now is through... Um, uh, we want to get some Sky Hub set up in some critical areas. Um, they're working with somebody on uh, Catal with Catalina Island to try and All get right. a sky yeah, hub out there. We're, 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 we're trying to, to get some of the types of devices that we can get without, you know, going bankrupt in some hmm. places to hopefully get us some, some actual hard evidence. And obviously once we get that, it, we're going to share it with everybody. You know, that's yeah. the whole purpose behind it. Um, but, yeah, the Skyhub sounds very Cronin interesting. Everything. Skyhub yeah, is. Means... Gary himself wants to uh, turn his Jeep into oh, a, yeah. a whole my mobile science station, and knowing Gary, he's actually going to do it. So, yeah, I had a conversation with one of the guys at Skyhub who who's done that that exact thing, and his. Uh, That's where his, Gary uh, got the idea. 
it it was i'm not sure if it was a jeep it probably was a jeep but it's, it looks pretty uh pretty amazing it lo looks like a lot of fun as well as they call it. <laughs> yeah yeah uh it's like a, a mobile ufo um bait slash detecting platform which will be uh which very interesting to do so the hope you know, is like i said with all that hard evidence to to get ourselves to the point when we are ready to to gear up and go out on a ship we we can bring much more specific equipment to get to you know yeah the truth for better or for worse for for words but instead of just going out there and guessing we're hoping this interim time with some things like sky hubs and some other technology to actually get some more specific direction for when we actually go out yeah it would be interesting have you have you personally had any ufo experiences no nope, no sir my this is this is my only tie in and i can't say i'm right. you know people try and get me to comment on on other stuff and i just a don't have the knowledge to really comment yeah. on it in a useful way or to be honest with you i don't have the interest my interest in in all of this is regardless of what we think it is or there was something in our airspace in 2014 or 20 2004 <laughs> You know, way back then, there was something that wasn't supposed to be there. And I don't care if it turns out to be a glorified weather balloon. I at least want to know what it is, you know. And that's yeah. one of the reasons I keep contributing what I can to the story to get to it, you know. Yeah, well, I appreciate uh, you kind of talking to me here. Is there, yeah. is there anything else you want to talk about that we haven't really covered or anything that we uh, didn't finish I don't think talking so. about? Yeah. But but I will do you a favor. People associate with sure. you associate you with the whole seagull story. And <laughs> I I am one who pokes at that seagull every once in a while. But you, you were joking when you said it, you weren't actually calling it a seagull, you know. Yeah. So people no. need to let that go, even if I'm one of the ones who keeps poking at it. We all need to let the seagull die. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And and no to be problem. fair on the, the seagull thing, like I, I did mention it in a conversation with UFO Jesus. And you, if you watch yep. it, you can see that we are kind of joking around. But uh, I, what I was saying was that when Fravor first saw the thing down by the water, there might have been a whole bunch of white things down there, like flecks of water and boats and possibly even seagulls. Uh, just down there at the water. I didn't mean that the actual thing that flew up and flew around him was a seagull, because that's obviously completely nonsense. Uh, and 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 really, the the whole seagull thing comes from my initial theory for the the go fast object, which is you know one of the other videos, completely different event. And people, you know, they thought that it was ridiculous for that, which it wasn't entirely, but uh, that's another story. And they, it kind of got tacked on to the uh, to the whole Nimitz thing. But you know, people like to <laughs> people like to have their little memes and things. It's just uh, annoying. It's a little bit annoying because it, it's a distraction and it, it makes people like not take the actual things I say seriously because they think, oh, that's Mick West, the seagull guy. Or not, I'm the, the Tic Tac guy. I even made a model of the Tic Tac at one point to do experiments with. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I think I think Fravor did see a real object uh, that uh, that time. I just don't know what it was. Correct. Like I said, we just want to get to that truth. Yeah, and if Fravor's out there, give me a call. But <laughs> or me, I'll bring the beer. It's not, it's not going to. Yeah, and I would be very happy to talk to anybody about this this type of thing. And I think the more uh, discussions we have, and the more we can actually dig, I think we actually need to be, do, do do digging and not just be telling stories. Uh, if we get dig down into the actual data, we can perhaps at least answer some of the questions that some people have. That, that's the hope. All right. Well, thank you very much, PJ. Anytime, Mick.